Well, now we're going to continue our series of messages on the topic of marriage, and we have been looking at five values for a rock-solid marriage and what it means for us to have values that are really steeped in core values of the Christian faith. And we're going to look at what it means for us to be mission-minded today, that we are, in fact, called to look at life beyond our own fulfillment and our own success, but what it means for us to be a light to others, certainly personally, but also in married life. And we're going to do that through a story that might be familiar to many of you, and we're going to look at Genesis chapter 12 in just a moment, and also through a testimony of two remarkable couples in this church, and you're going to be really hearing about their experience of the faith uh, as, as two generations will be present in just a few minutes. So now we're going to turn to the Word of God, Genesis chapter 12, and we'll begin with the first verse, and then Genesis 17. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants that are after him. And as far as Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. Why don't we just pause for a word of prayer? Good and gracious God, we thank you for this amazing scripture passage and for your faithfulness to your people throughout all generations. And we pray now, God, that you would speak to us this morning and that you would take these written words and that they would truly be living words to us. And God, we have not come here to hear a human voice or a human opinion, but rather we have come to hear from you and we desire to have an encounter with the risen and the reigning Christ. And so will you, will you bless your word and I pray for all the hearts that are here. I pray for, for all of our lives, that, Lord, that we would know what it means to have a marriage of significance, of meaning. And, Lord, what it means for us to share our lives, to pour them out into the life of people that we may know, that we may encounter throughout our daily living. May we, O oh God, receive your spirit this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite authors and columnists of the New York Times is a man named David Brooks, and he recently authored a book called The Second Mountain. And there he suggests that there are really two mountains that we can live upon and pursue in this life. There's a life of success, and there's a life of significance. The first mountain, the life of success, is about achievement. It's about fulfillment. It's self-actualization. And the life of significance is about taking all the good that one has had, devoting it to a larger purpose, to a larger person, even God, and allowing it to bless the life of other people. And so this morning, we're going to consider what it means that our life in marriage and our life in committed relationships can be used as a way in which we can desire, as a way in which we can pour out our life into others. And as we look at our scripture it seems to me that Abraham and Sarah are a couple that are living their life on the second mountain. 
they're living their life as a, as a path, as a means toward significance. And we see that in Genesis chapter 12, that God calls Abraham. And it's, what's really interesting about it is that both Abraham and Sarah at our, are at a ripe old age. They're closely approaching, closely approaching 90, and they're getting a little bit comfortable. And God says, well, I want to choose you. I'm going to elect you. I'm going to be profoundly good to you. But here's the thing. I'm going to bless you in order that you can be a blessing. I'm going to make you great that you can shine a light into the life of other people. And we see eventually that Sarah, or Sarai, at an elderly age, ends up giving birth to a son named Isaac. They are pursuing a life of significance and will eventually found a nation to care for, to be a light toward other people. Another couple in the Bible that does this in the New Testament is one that we have most certainly heard of. It's Mary and Joseph. And Mary receives word from the Holy Spirit that she will be impregnated and that she will give birth to a, a, a baby who she will name Jesus. And Joseph is told about this, and we all know that Joseph, rightfully so, is really concerned about the appointment because they have not had relations, they are not married, and so he receives also a word from the Spirit of God that I need you to support this vision for Mary's life, and I want you to play supporting cast and for you to be married. They, too, are seeking a life of significance, and you can see what they are doing is they are actually living a God-bearing life, seeking to literally <laughs> bear God, the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ, and he will be truly the light for all nations and for all people. We, like Abraham and Sarah and like Joseph and Mary, were meant to live a life of significance. And there's a number of different ways and practices that we can, that we can carry this out. And one of them would be through compassion and care for the poor. As we are seeking to care for the least of these, that is one practice of our faith that allows us to live on the mountain of significance. We can also demonstrate our faith in pursuing the second mountain by demonstrating hospitality. We can be hospitable to people, even strangers. We can open our home as a means toward being a blessing. We can also do this through being involved in community and being committed to the body of Christ. And furthermore, we can do it through the sharing of our faith as we tell others about the love of God in Christ and invite them into a life of faith as well. But we are called to live lives of significance, not merely the white picket fence and the golden lab, but rather to look for something beyond ourselves, to devote ourselves to God and to his purposes in our lives. And so what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to invite two couples in our church that are going to tell us a little bit about them, their life on the second mountain and pursuing significance. And it's uh, Joanne and Jeff Kreit and Caleb and Alyssa Miller. You guys can... Come on forward. Go ahead and sit up here. Yeah. And I'll tell you, there are a lot of couples in our church who model this extraordinarily well. And I've had the privilege of getting to know uh, both these outstanding couples, uh, my two and a half years of being here. And so I thought they would just have so much to be able to say and share with you. And briefly, I want to make some introductions. And the first is... Uh, Jeff and Joanne. Jeff right now is an elder of our church. He sits on our session, and Joanne is a, a teacher actually by calling and profession, and she shares her teaching gifts with our church, especially through web. We have Alyssa, who is working right now in our children's ministry department. And we have Caleb, and Caleb is a man who requires a lot of support and prayer. He's on our associate pastor nominating committee, um, so we want to encourage him and come alongside of him. No. But it's a, it's, a very, it's a very committed group. They meet every week. They've been meeting for several months. So I first just want to thank you guys for being up here and sharing, you know, somewhat of your testimony of how you have lived up on the second mountain pursuing significance and really how married life is about um, really, really a calling. <laughs> you know, we each have our own callings, but together as a married couple, we are, we are called by God to pursue something beyond ourselves. So uh, just briefly, tell us how long you've been married and also how long you've been committed here at Bidwell. We've been married for 34 years, and, uh, and we've... Uh, <laughs> that, that goes more for her than me, probably. 
And, uh, and we've been joining, I've been members uh, at Big O for 21 years. We've been married for nine years this summer, and uh, we've been at Bidwell for five years this summer. All right, thank you. Uh, and tell us a little bit about how you see you know, Christian marriage as unique, as opposed to a marriage that doesn't have Christ as the center. Okay. Um, there's a couple factors that immediately came to mind as I was thinking about this question, and one is that my identity and Joanne's identity is not in our spouse or even in ourselves, but as believers, married or not, our identity is outside of us and is in, uh, is, is in God, is in Jesus Christ. So that's our foundation, and that forms how we approach the world, how we approach our relationship is from that. I think another thing that, um, that w we see modeled perfectly by Jesus, and that is his death on the cross and, and resurrection, that is perfect forgiveness for everything that we've done and can do. And in marriage, there's a lot of opportunity to forgive and to be forgiven. And with such a wonderful model, a perfect model uh, that we have in Christ, uh, that I think in our relationship, as much as that as we can impart to each other and give each other room and space for screwing up and, and, and making mistakes and all that, we're called to do that. And we have it modeled, and I think that separates maybe us from the world in that we have that perfect way to do that shown to us. So um, a lot of you aren't married yet. A lot of you are. One of the precious things about Christian marriage is this common core set of assumptions about the world and about your worldview and about your faith. So when you come up against hard stuff, and you will, you know, we have for, we've been married for 34 years. There's been all, lots of different kinds of challenging times, sometimes circumstantial, things that have occurred around us, um, in our families, and sometimes between the two of us. We've, we've had rough patches, uh, but we always can come back to the fact that we have this faith in common. And that's true also with your friends, with your other relationships. You probably know that when you share your faith with one another, th that that's a common uh, place to kind of put your feet down uh, together, that it, it, uh, you can encourage one another and push one another a little bit in, in your faith walk. Uh, similar to what Joanne was saying, um, I think that Christian marriages are unique because it's a, it's a cord of three strands, and that's really valuable, um, and it's much, much stronger together. And during the valleys, uh, we have a really invaluable book to reference that the God has given us, and in the mountains, we, um, we give God the glory and the praise, and that takes the pressure off of each other. And while we're always a work in progress, remembering to give God the praise during the high times and to go to God during the low times and everything in between, um, it is something unique that is wonderful and I'm so thankful for um, in a Christian marriage. Uh, so my notes are sitting right there, so we'll see how this goes. Um, <laughs> but for me, I just, I always look back to Christ and his example as the bridegroom and um, just his example of compassion and love and um, sacrifice ultimately for for his, spi his spouse or the uh, the church and the way that you lay yourself down for it and your needs and your desires for for your marriage and your spouse and um, just give of yourself to uh, to make what will ultimately be greater than the sum of its parts uh, a marriage that is more than either of you could achieve by yourselves. And how do you view you know, the role of the church in building us up in married life as we try to look at married life you know, as, a, as a calling, as something more than just what we do for each other, but serving beyond ourselves? How does the church build us up in that? I think the church serves a number of roles. Yeah. Um, one of them is just pure instruction and, and uh, you know, whether entering the pulpit or going to classes or Bible studies like what we do in our home, but in teaching others the word. Uh, maybe even Equal to that, or perhaps even more important, is that we are called, uh, my ge our generation here, are called to you guys uh, to be mentors and to be disciples and, and to be people that, whose lives can be imitated. Uh, Paul talks about that in a couple of his letters, that we are told to be imitators. Uh, and, uh, and so I think a key role for the church is to live into other people, particularly, like I say, live into the, other, the younger generations and encourage them in their in their marriages and the raising of families, which we we don't have all the answers, but we've been down that path, and encourage you, you young folks into uh, roles of leadership. But we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, we, um, you know, we've been in the church for a lot of years, and not just this church, but other churches before this. 
And we've been the beneficiaries of all kinds of more, gone before us, mature Christian believers. And I know when I was a young mom with two wild boys um, running all over the place that I just ran to the women that had gone before as a working mom. You know, just all, a lot of you that are doing that know how challenging all, fitting all those puzzle pieces together can be. So doing life together, and that's one of the things that I have been just wildly impressed by the group that we are privileged to interact with of, of people in your age group, because you do life together astonishingly well. Um, so that's, that's the nature of fellowship, and the church provides a place for that and a way to connect that is um, invaluable. I agree with that. Um, I think the church is a safe place to come and learn who you are in the community and learn what your gifts are and learn um, the way that you were built to serve. And our church offers so many avenues of doing that, whether it's listening to sermons or um, opportunities to to um, serve and to work in ministries or to take classes or to just sit together and listen to what each other has to say. Sometimes that can just bring so much wisdom and life and growth. Um, and the church really rallies around you and sets you up for success when you walk out of whatever door it is, whether it's a you know Wednesday night Bible study or Sunday mornings. Um, we're, we're set up and, and we're ready to go for what's outside these doors in this community. Um, and and our, I think our church does that really, really well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the things that it just kind of came to my head when we were thinking about this were um, just the opportunities that the church provides for us. So not only do they pour into our lives through things like Bible study and, um, you know, men's discipleship groups and, you know, weekly sermons and, you know, additional emails that come in through the week. I mean, there's resources there that you wouldn't find anywhere else outside of a, a faith community. Um, but it also provides opportunities to give back. And that, again, challenges you and, and helps you to grow and develop in your faith and in the greatest part is it doesn't reflect on you. It doesn't point back to you. It's just Christ working through us. And so those opportunities to give back to the community and, um, and really just help develop, that's, you know, kind of the two biggest things that, um, that came to mind. Phenomenal. Thank you. And uh, tell us about your experience in the church, you know, how you have sought to serve, be a part of the body of Christ, and then sort of your unique uh, mission. I'll start with Joanne and Jeff. You know, your, your unique mission God placed upon your heart and how you can serve others. Okay. Um, right now, our, our, one of our key missions uh, is ministering to young adults through this uh, weekly group that, uh, that we have in our home. <clears throat> in addition to that, I've also served as an elder, done mission trips. So there's been a variety of things through the, through the 21 years here at Bidwell that I've been privileged to uh, be a part of God's work. But uh, like the last 10 years, it's been 10 years we've had this Bible study, this weekly group. Uh, that meets in our homes. It evolved from a college ministry and now is young adults. Uh, so we used to go to graduations and now we go to weddings, more baby showers than anything these days. Uh, and um, so we've just loved being a part of their lives. And we, we have done that through kind of similar to what I mentioned a little bit ago. Uh, our, our, Bible, our, our home group really is a Bible study. We have just learned it was culture and shifting so quickly that scripture is the one thing that we can count on to never change. And what God said years ago is still entirely true and appropriate for today. So we really relied on scripture, and we, so we do a Bible study. We work our way through, <clears throat> through a book of the Bible verse by verse. Uh, th but the other thing also that's equal to that is the community, that, uh, that the discipling and mentoring that we've been able to do with that, and then this, the community uh, that has come out of that through these young adults that... Uh, graces with their entry into our home, uh, we get just as much out of it as they do, maybe more, probably more. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a developmentalist by training, and that's what I taught in my career. And um, I just love, and we have done this quite a number of times in our group, love um, speaking into the people in the group and encouraging each individual to live into their, their passions and their gifts and their strengths uh, in their mission to the world. So we've seen amazing just leaps of faith from the young people in our group. Um, they're getting older. I don't know, like you said, I don't think young people is the right word anymore. <laughs> the adults in our group, um, but they're not as old as us. So um, 
we just love supporting and encouraging that process. And um, again, doing life together. Uh, we there was a pastor here, Jim Coons, uh, who worked with the young adults, and he referred to a certain kind of friend as a refri refrigerator friend, which means they can come in your house and open your refrigerator and um, take or put. Usually, it's take. Um, so they got a whole bunch of refrigerator friends uh, coming over to our house quite often. They know where everything is. And that's really cool. We love that. Um, when we were doing this over at the other church, I could see the people in our generation going, that's ministry. Ministry is supposed to be hard. And here you are hanging out with these really cool people. And I thought, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a great delight for us, and we learn so much all the time. They keep a well-stocked fridge. We appreciate that. <laughs> For me, um, my, I get so much joy out of um, working with Kidwell Park in our children's ministry. Um, those kids are awesome, and kids in general are just, they're amazing, and they're so much fun, um, and I feel so lucky to have been welcomed into uh, our amazing children's ministry team here and been able to just kind of um, give ideas and to just uh, see something and develop it and see a program and add a couple things that would be fun and, and just just love on these kids and speak into their lives, and I'm just so uh, thankful that I have such a great opportunity to do that here at, at this church. And then community-wise, outside of these doors, um, I, I just feel strongly that if you have the capabilities to uh, have the time or the resources or um, anything, really, to provide any kind of relief in any way to your community or your family or your friends, um, that that idea shouldn't be ignored. And um, I'm really thankful and, and really lucky that I have a marriage that uh, we both agree on that concept. And when we have a crazy, spontaneous, or well-thought-out idea to meet a need that we see, we can support each other amongst jobs and kids and what have you um, to meet those needs. And with that, I've seen our church come alongside us when we need some support in uh, fulfilling needs that we see in our community or with our friends and family. And for example, um, in the midst of the campfire, I wanted to put together this mm, Parents' Day Out program so people could get a breath of fresh air, whether they're a part of the church or not. And we had uh, over 40 kids in the church rallied around me to put that together and just basically said, all right, cool, what do you need? And we made it happen and it was really successful. And that was just so humbling for me that I, I get to be a part of a church that rallies around um, living life the way God wants you to live it. Um, and I, it's important to us to lead by example for our two girls, for our kids, so that, that they can see that if you want to meet a need in your community or with your friends and family, you've got a team behind you, and we will absolutely make it happen. I don't know how much longer we can refer to it as a young adults group. Um, I think that's, that window might be ending. Uh, my opportunities to serve has come through a, a couple of avenues. Um, I remember vividly the first time I walked into the El Rey Theater and uh, just being in worship there, and I was just blown away by um, the heart and the quality. And uh, right after service, I went and tracked Brent down, and uh, I haven't stopped bugging him since uh, to let me be involved. And I've had the, the pleasure of being on the worship team for almost five years now. And uh, I just absolutely love it. And then more recently, I was actually, um, or not elect, selected to uh, serve on the APNC, or the Associate Pastor Nominating Committee. And uh, while that's not as much fun as playing worship, uh, it has been a really cool opportunity to just um, push into the future and the development of the church body and just, you know, get to play a role in something that will ultimately be extremely important for this community and this service and the college and the young adults here. And uh, it's just an exciting time. Um, and I'm just so grateful for that opportunity. And then I also get to serve alongside Alyssa, who's, whose heart is really for giving and for people. And uh, as soon as any of our friends express a need for literally anything, she's the first person to respond back. Uh, <laughs> and um, and put herself out there to uh, to just take on and step up to those roles, and it's been a challenge for myself to um, to just roll with those um, those ideas and those opportunities, thought out or not. Usually not that well thought out, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> and uh, so it's just been a, a growing and a challenging time, but um, I'm just honored to stand next to someone like her. And briefly, can you touch upon your experience in Africa? Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. Um, so it was a couple of years ago now. Uh, our daughter, Elliot, she's three now. She was 10 months old then, and an opportunity came up for us to go serve in Africa and build zip lines for a children's Christian camp. And um, 
you know, my opportunity to serve there was actually um, allowing Alyssa to go and take our five-year-old at the time, and uh, she went, and because she has, a, um, you know, a medical experience, was able to to pour into those people, not only through building zip lines, which are very necessary in Africa, turns out, um, but also providing support to um, pregnant women and working in the clinic there and um, just helping in any way she could, and uh, that was an incredible opportunity, and I'm just so glad you were able to do it. Phenomenal. Thank you. Uh, I want to I want to thank you both for your service to Christ, service to the church, and you know the the, the this cup, this group that you've had, this community has been really amazing. And it was kind of a nudge that Christ placed on your hearts, and then Christ placed on your hearts to be a part of that. Uh, and I want to lift up to the church right now just the image of generations coming together, and how important that is for Bidwell Presbyterian Church that. We want to have the, 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 the generations serving alongside one another, being in community, knowing each other, getting familiar with each other's perspectives. And you guys have modeled that so well uh, together, and then also each as, as couples, just being so faithful about significance and living up on the second mountain and lis listening to what Christ has in store for you. So why don't I give these guys a round of applause? Um, thank you. That's, that's it. So now, a question for us this morning, of course, is which mountain are we pursuing? Which mountain are we living on? Is it the mountain of success, of, of achievement, of uh, self-actualization, self-fulfillment, the white picket fence, <laughs> the golden lab? Or are we looking for something more? And the peace, the joy, and the security we so deeply long for in our souls, it comes from living up on the second mountain of pursuing significance with our lives. And we want to consider individually, and if we're married as a couple, are we seeking to be on mission for Christ? And we've looked at a lot in this series, and you might want to consider just from the beginning of this series, what has God been placing on your heart for you to consider? Is there a nudge from the Holy Spirit? Week one, we looked at what it means that faith comes first in marriage and in life. Our, our faith comes before our marriage partner, always. We looked at commitment, and what it means for us to honor a covenant commitment in the way that Christ honors his covenant commitment to love us unconditionally and to make a promise and to keep it. We looked at friendship and the idea of companionship. And we heard a really touching testimony from Bill and Christy Harrington. If you were not here that Sunday, I want you to please go online and go listen to her. You can look into, listen to the podcast. Last week, we considered unity and the gospel and how really... In marriage, we seek to embody and live out the gospel, the gospel of Christ. And now today, of uh, the two mountains. And we want to be people of significance. We want to be aware of the invitation that Christ has played, placed upon our lives. A life not just of success, a life of significance, a life of meaning, purpose, and fulfillment. That, friends, we would always be a people who are on mission for God.